Uh, hey gents, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. This video is brought to you in part by Big Daddy Unlimited. You want to help out Tactical Rifleman, go down to Big Daddy Unlimited, sign up. It'll help you get uh, a lot of stuff at greater discounts and helps us out too. It's, it's actually a pretty cool setup, really is. This video this week, we're going to talk about the Raptor M2. That's this optic right here by Primary Arms. Uh, a lot of our viewers, was, they were like, hey Carl, go check out some of the optics by Primary Arms, uh, lower price lines. Uh, they've got scopes all the way down, or just a couple hundred dollars. Good stuff. Now, uh, you notice this is a variable power scope we're running on an AR. Uh, I'm big on that because of my sniper background in the military. I like having optics. I like variable power optics so that uh, I can zoom out when I'm in close to the buildings, but if the bad guys are at a long distance, I can then zoom in. Why is that important on an AR? Now, of course, all the assaulters, they like to run their uh, EOTEX for our units. Some units run aim points, but we mostly ran EOTEX. But uh, some of us, we would run the variable powers. And the reason for that is we would uh, neutralize that whole target 90 seconds. Blow the front and back door, flood it with multiple assault cells, take the whole target down 90 seconds, 90 seconds flat. After that, you might be sitting on target for 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, while they do what we call SSE, sensitive site exploitation, pulling hard drives, um, tactical questioning, because we don't interrogate anymore, tactical questioning of people there on target. This all takes time. Now, while all that's happening, there's no more bad guys inside the building. We're all the bad guys. They're all outside. They're all staying back around two, 300 meters where they feel safe because they know they can't shoot 300 meters. That's where these things come in. You get up high up on the roof and we're using good night vision, a variable power scope with a horse reticle, whatever it is you're using. It's very, very easy to identify as friend or foe, uh, somebody that warrants deadly force, and it's very easy to shoot them in the face at three, four, 500 meters. So I'm a big, big fan of variable power optics. Now I started running variable power optics all the way back like 2005, 2006 timeframe. Uh, my biggest gripe with variable powers like this that go one to eight, one to six, one to five, whatever they are, is most of them historically have always been second focal plane. In other words, uh, the crosshairs stay the same size as you run one to eight, the target just gets larger or smaller. Uh, I don't like that. A lot of people like second focal plane for competition shooting because they still always get to see their crosshairs. I don't like that because I often would use the, mil re uh, the horse reticle or mill dots. And if I'm holding one mil for wind, I need it to be one mil all the time, not just on eight power. So if I have it zoomed back on four power, so I have a wider field of view for situational awareness on the battlefield, I still need those tick marks to be one mil or two tenths of a mil, whatever the increments are. That's why I like first focal plane. Now, the reason why a lot of them don't do first focal plane is it's very hard to have a true one power on a scope like this. You bring it down to what they label them, they market them as a one to eight, one to six, one to seven, whatever it is. But when you bring it down to one power and you bring it up with both eyes open, it's not, you know, normal size targets this size, this one is just slightly bigger. So they're not really a true one power, they're more like a 1.1. Uh, and that can be a big deal. All right. But um, I got asked, hey, Carl, check out Primary Arms. Uh, roughly the same time, the guy that actually designed this reticle, the Raptor M2, uh, he's like, hey, I'd love you to check out this new reticle. Okay, cool. So let's check it out. Uh, got the optic in. I, I've got it mounted in a worn mount. And the cool part about it, it's made by uh, uh, Primary Arms. This particular scope, it's got a little larger uh, diameter tube on it, and it's got different glass. Right. But the reason why they did that was uh, a number of different reasons. I'll get to them in a minute. But the, what really sets this apart from the rest of them is it has what's called the Raptor M2 ACSS reticle, Advanced Combat Sighting System. Right. It's a little bit different than the one that was in the ACOG. We did a review of that. 
uh, about a month ago but this one right here is a awesome awesome scope I like the reticle design uh, it's very very close to a scope that I helped uh, run uh, helped develop for horse vision back in the day prototype I ran it in Iraq a bunch of times great scope that particular version never went into production and kind of pissed me off because I like the design of the the circle on the reticle and they never put it in production so when I saw that circle part in this reticle as I like, hell yeah let me look at it let me shoot the hell out of this thing so I got it just first right out of the box um, doesn't say made in China this is got it's made in Japan a lot of people that doesn't matter but when you start talking about all the big scope companies uh, with this night force a lot of the other ones good glass HD glass high density glass is coming from Japan uh, it's great great glass now the cool part about being primary arms is they've got a lifetime warranty doesn't matter if all you're going to do is play in the backyard your little pew pew stuff on uh, Instagram or you hunt a little bit but if you're a, a serious operator law enforcement guy or somebody that just likes to beat the hell out of the kit like I do lifetime warranty really comes in handy I am if I excel at nothing else guys I'm good at breaking stuff and so again I love first focal plane I gotta have first focal plane because I need those dots to stay the same now when you start getting deep in the weeds with this ACS uh, Raptor reticle all right um, the best part about it when you're looking at it it's got the big red circle on the outside now you don't really use that for anything when you're on eight power but when you dial all the way down to one power when you're in close uh, at CQB distances running around that's like that round circle uh, inside the EOTech that you guys know I love that that big circle helps get you on target right away now because the reticle is etched glass it doesn't matter if you have the reticle turned off by by that I mean the uh, the illuminated reticle if, it, if you have the illumination turned on it's bright red it's easy to find but even if it's turned off it still shows up as black so it's great on one power for doing close in work inside the house home defense things like that now this particular scope with the ACSS reticle uh, that reticle is built for bullet drop compensation as you can see in the reticle it has hash marks going all the way out to 800 meters in 100 meter marks I know you guys know I'm not a BDC guy not at all uh, the military used to run BDC's uh, a lot of the different reticles going all the way back to the art one art two art three series the Redfield scopes on the old m21s and then uh, forward the m3 alpha ultra uh, you know you dialed in distances on the top instead of it uh, having uh, a true mills advantages and disadvantages you would have to have data for different different environments in other words where you zero the gun one temperature one distance above sea level you slip it for that's at 300 meters now go somewhere else and you might have to be at three plus one or three minus two while you're shooting uh, 9,000 feet in the summertime on the edge of a volcano in Ethiopia uh, it does it throws off your BDCs right so um, I'm not like I said, I'm not a big fan of BDCs but remember this scope is not for snipers it's not for guys that that's their trained mission they're going to be running SR 25s with good glass on it right, this is more your intermediate range marksman designated marksman right so looking at that one of the key things that affects for them is uh, being able to judge winds snipers are trained to do that being able to estimate range snipers are trained how to do that all right but your average Joe anybody that buys this scope they don't have they're not school trained to do that so the biggest thing right off the bat that hurts guys is range estimation how far away is that bad guy guys panic and all they do is they put that center dot on the scope or that center of the crosshairs on that coyote that's running that deer that uh, Mahdi militia guy whatever it is and they pull the trigger you're not gonna get hits you're, you're not uh, the gravity starts hitting that bullet as soon as it leaves the barrel so you need to be able to judge range you need to be able to do range estimation that's a cool part with this reticle is the center reticle you'll notice the winds the lines are wider at the top where you have your 
um, your two, four, six, and all, all the way down to eight marks. They get narrow as they go down. And what that is designed to do is it is designed for the soldier, the operator, to mill the width of the soldiers of that target that they're, uh, they're engaging downrange. So it's set up for 18 inch wide shoulders across the shoulders. Now, if you're just hunting coyotes, uh, deer, stuff like that, you're gonna have to find another way to measure. But for, uh, for a man-sized target, put it on the width of the shoulders, move your reticle up and down, and when the width of his shoulders matches out with the width of that line, whether it's 400, 600, whatever it is, bang, that's the width, that's the, uh, that's the distance that he's at. If there's no wind, roll through the trigger, you got rounds on target, All right? So, um, other ways to estimate range with this thing. But before I get there, I'm gonna take a quick break so we can have YouTube stick in another uh, advertisement. All right, hey gents, welcome back. Uh, we just went over how to uh, do range estimation the width of a target. I'm not real big on that because you're not measuring a very uh, large part. Uh, the larger the object is that you're doing range estimation on using the worm formula, mill relation formula, uh, the easier it is for you and more accurate it is for you to estimate range. So I prefer full height. Now, this reticle has uh, steady lines for you to actually do full height of the target. Now, it's calibrated for a guy that is 5 foot 10 inches tall. 5 foot 10 inches, which is awesome, right? Now, if the guy is half height or he, uh, I mean, if he's hidden behind a bush, if he you, uh, he's squatting down, just mill him from the waist up to the top of his head and you just double that number, right? So if that mills out at such and such, um, if it would be 800, then you're only using half of it to see uh, that height, he'd be 400 meters away. Makes sense, easy stuff. So the scope is very effective for estimating range. Now the other thing that bites uh, operators in the tail when they're shooting at long distance is winds. First, you need to be able to uh, judge winds. Now, to deal with that, to do your math, you have to know the speed of the wind and the direction that the wind is blowing. Uh, for example, a full value wind coming perpendicular to how you're shooting is gonna affect your bullet a lot more than a wind that's blowing at you at an angle. Everybody thinks if it's 45 degrees, that's a half value wind. Half value is actually closer to 10 and a half, 11 o'clock, all right? Well, they, they run radar tests on bullets. So you're looking at about a three quarter value wind at, at uh, 45 degrees, All right? So this scope's not all, you don't have to be spinning windage knobs or nothing like that. You'll notice when you look at the reticle, it has two lines of dots coming down. The first line of dots, the inner one, that is for a five mile an hour full value wind set at the appropriate distances. And then the outer line is for a 10 mile an hour wind. So you start, doing, uh, you start ranging the guy, you figure out he's 400 meters or let's say 500 meters. You go out to that dot, line it up, and if, or if it's a five mile an hour wind, crank it off. If it's a 10 mile an hour wind, but it's blowing from 1030, it's a half value wind, cut it in half, go use the five dot. If it's a two and a half mile of wind, mile an hour wind, shoot between the, the five mile an hour wind dot and the center steady line. If it's a seven and a half mile an hour wind, shoot between the five and the 10 dot. It's easy, you see how the math works here. Now, when you look at the reticle, uh, the center steady line, you'll see that there are also uh, black dots out to the left and right. They're just floating out in the middle of nowhere. That's not just random stuff put there to uh, look cool. Uh, what we've seen over the years, uh, bad guys running around on the modern battlefield, especially when they get in a gunfight, they don't just stand there and walk around like movers do on the, on the shooting range. The guys sprint from one point to another. Now, when you go to lead that guy, everybody does the Kentucky windage, and you're basically leading in front of him. How far do you shoot in front of him? How far? How do you do it? How fast is he going? Well... Again, studies done, lots of data. It took the guy 10 years to finally uh, finish this reticle, get it where he's finally happy with it. Uh, a speed for a guy sprinting with a rifle is 8.6 miles per hour. You don't need to remember that number. What you need to remember is that that black dot in the reticle is set up for a guy sprinting at 
8.6 miles per hour. Now, th this is effective out to about 300 meters. Get past that, and then you've got to start worrying about bullet flight, time of flight, and everything. But out to 300 meters, um, I'm told those lead dots are right on. I say I'm, I'm, I'm told that because I wasn't there when they tested that part of it. The testing and shooting that I've done with this uh, scope, and we've done a lot of it, I did not actually do the moving target dots with it. I haven't got that set up on my range yet. I tried to get guys to volunteer to hold the target in front of them while I shot at them, and uh, I couldn't get anybody to do that. All right, so let's talk about mounting this thing. All right, when, when you mount this scope, uh, try to set it up so you've got the same eye relief as you would your regular optic. Dial it up on max, uh, max magnification. Set it so you're not, you don't see a shadow on other, any side of the scope. That means you've got proper eye, li eye relief. If you do it when it's set on one power, the eye relief uh, window is much, much broader. And uh, if you then cinch it down, you're, uh, you won't notice that your eye relief might be off when it's on max magnification. That's basic for uh, mounting a scope. If you want more detailed instructions on that, I did a whole video, you can find it in the archive, on just how to mount scopes onto a rifle. But basically, once you've got it centered, it's roughly to the, the, the back of the uh, lower, lower receiver here. What you wanna do is you want to adjust the ocular focus, the ocular lens on the back here. The cool part is a lot of your cheaper quality scopes, you can't adjust the ocular lens. I need this ability because I'm old now. Uh, my eyes are shot, so I have a choice. I can shoot with reading glasses on, or I can dial this scope so that it matches to my actual prescription for my eyes. And when other people look through my scope, they might think uh, the reticle is a little blurry. Now, when you're focusing this, you're not looking at the target. Just look at the sky, the wall of a building, an empty field, and all you're focusing is the reticle. You want the reticle to be crystal clear so that you can take full advantage of all those wind dots and everything else. Make that crystal clear and uh, stick that scope cap back on, and it really does lock it in place. It's not going to go anywhere. All right. Um, your magnification knob, very, very easy to turn, but not too easy to turn. You And you can get the little throw levers that go out on the side. The little polymer ones are great for shooting three gun. And honestly, that would be the one thing that I will add to this scope down the road is I'm gonna add the lever for so that I can spin magnification faster. All right, um, windage and elevation knobs are done right here. You have to lift them up to unlock them. All right, and then once you've set it, you can lower that, lock them back into place. Advantages, disadvantages of that. Some like the captured caps uh, where the cap goes over the top completely protects it. All right? um, that's fine, but others have the knobs that are completely free. I don't like those for combat because you'll end up bumping it on your kit in the dark, the edge of the Humvee, edge of the helicopter, and they'll turn and now your zero's off. I like the ones, this is just like the design on my Smitten Bender, you've got to lift it up to turn it. Uh, when would you use that if you're using a BDC that's already set? I, I don't really know so much for this with the BDC, but I know there are times with my other scopes, uh, if I'm going to be holding 18, um, 18 mils elevation, I might put 10 on the top knob and then just hold for 8 below. But it was great knobs, great setup. It is a a great uh, scope so far. Now the other side, you have got your illumination knob. Now um, it's cool, it, it does have night vision settings one and two. Uh, the cool part is between one and two or two and three all the way up. You put it between any two numbers and the scope turns off, all right? So that you don't have to worry about going all the way from zero all the way up to nine or 10, wherever it is you need to be. Great, great feature. Now. The disadvantages of this is you do you see this is not a parallax knob. A lot of scopes this size, they do not put a parallax knob on that. In other words, a lot of people call it a focus knob for actually focusing the target on the same focal plane that the crosshairs are on. Now, uh, you'll find that knob on a lot of your high-end sniper rifle scopes. The reason for that is if you can focus your target on the same focal plane that your reticle is on, it doesn't matter where your head is on the scope. If it's forward, back, whether you're shooting odd shooting positions, off of a roof, on rocks, on the side of a mountain, it doesn't matter because you've removed the parallax. 
great and that's why those sniper scopes cost extra money they have all those extra features added this doesn't have that and the reason why i bring that up is when you get down behind the gun you have got to have your head in the same place on the stock every time if you zero in one position and the next time you get down it's over here over here it will throw off the zero of the weapon it really will right so it's it's important the other thing i don't like about the the windage knob and this it's a con and i've already passed it on to him is it doesn't lock right so not a big deal for civilians not a big deal for competition shooters they take it out of the case they go straight to the firing line but for me this thing might be riding on the front of my body armor for days right uh, hours whole missions riding in humvees getting off of helicopters and i have never not one time gotten off the helicopter the humvee gone to open up and look through turn on my illuminated reticle overseas in the combat zone i have never once had that reticle turn on it's always had a dead battery in it always because uh horus uh, all these other companies they put easy to turn knobs and they get hooked on the front of my kit and everybody else's kits and the batteries go dead so a um, couple companies have versions that they do lock smith and bender has a version that does um uh, swap out the batteries that's all you got to do is swap out the batteries not that big a deal unless you actually need that illuminated reticle it was never a big deal for me because with the etched ring even if the battery's dead uh, because the reticle is etched onto the glass i can still see the black ring so it works for me it works uh, i didn't die huh who saw that coming All right um and night vision if you're using good night vision i don't need an illuminated reticle so hey um i'm gonna get into zeroing it and how we ran this puppy through the test but for, before I do that, I've really got to, because uh, it's a long video, I'm getting long-winded here, I need to take another minute uh, and let YouTube stick another uh, advertisement in. Oh, hey, gents, welcome back. Hey, um, now I want to talk about zeroing, right? Uh, the cool part about this thing is, because it's BDC, it's set for different types of ammo. It comes with a great cheat sheet. So that no matter uh, your barrel length, type of ammo you're using, uh, it, it gives you all the data to do it. Now, um, so you can do it different ammo, which is kind of cool. 5.56, 7.62, 5.45 for those guys that like that. And one thing that was cool about this is you can also use it for the 6.5 Grendel, which for a lot of guys that like the smaller AR frame, that is a hot round for, uh, for this, uh, this size lower receiver. All right, so for us, um, we decided to use the M193, which is a 55 grain, and this is a 16-inch heavy barrel that I've got a uh, Adams Arms um, piston upper in. All right, now, went to go look that up, 16-inch barrel, uh, 55 grain ammo, and it said on the little cheat sheet to zero at one inch high at 100 meters. Piece of cake, I can do that. Go down, put the pasty right above it, um, work just fine. All right, so what that does by zeroing one inch high, it then takes the trajectory of the bullet and it basically equates the rest of the bullet drop compensator to be correct. Now, that's the thing I kind of have an issue with is uh, your ballistic trajectories of these different ammos are a little bit off. Now, I understand um, changing your zero point puts them close. Now, if all you're doing is shooting full-size torsos yeah i understand for for a combat site uh where that would be accurate but if you're a tack driver type guy and you want headshots and tee boxes things like that it, again it, it rubs me the wrong way but you know i want to give this thing a fair shake so how do you test something like this a lot of guys that um they'll bring these scopes out and um, all they do is they uh, they go out and plink. They basically do a field shoot with it at all this different uh, steel. But it's how do you measure that? You know, um, well, he missed. Okay, he missed, but why did he miss? So what we did was we wanted to control it some more. The biggest issues that tear people up when they're uh, when they're using guns like this on a undis unknown distance range again is range estimation and wind. All right. Most people will just test this thing shooting at steel plates that are always the same size. How, uh, you can go up and look up other videos and that's what they did. They go out, ting, 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 
sounds great, looks awesome on Instagram and YouTube, but I wanted to, I want to put this scope through the paces. I want to give it a real test. So uh, we've done this before. Uh, we have this drill we call the fortune cookie test. Rather than me picking a distance just randomly out there and shooting, oh, he missed when I was at such and such distance, we write down what the exact distance was. That way when we see, okay, he milled using the width of the target. He did range estimation with the width or he did range estimation of the top when he was at such and such distance and he missed. That allows us, what we're doing is we're taking a lot of the variables out of it so we can then give you, the viewer, a, uh, a more educated review of it. And that's what you want, right? You don't just want to hear me babble about, oh, it's a great gun, we got to get it, spend your money. I'm going to let you guys know how it actually did. So how we do it, uh, Chad grabbed a few of these. We ran out to the farm and Chad had these, not me. I laid down behind the gun. Chad took the laser range finder and a target stand. I did not shoot Chad. And Chad ran out the distance. Now, Chad is five foot 10, all right? Um, I misspoke before. I've told people before, Chad is five seven. I just looked down on him so much, but Chad's actually five ten. He got out there and what I would do is he'd stand there and I would use the range estimation reticle either width of the shoulders or height. Sometimes I do it both ways. I would figure out what the range would be. And uh, now remember, he was out there with the laser range finder, not pointing it at me, but what he would do is he would point it at the Jeep. He'd laze the Jeep. Don't, don't laze your buddies, guys. He lays the Jeep and he'd move forward and backwards till he got to that set distance, which the first one was at 120, uh, 141 meters. And once he was set, uh, in the right spot, I would range estimation on him, and then he would go over and he'd sit in the golf cart, and I'd shoot at the target. Right? Um, the first one was at 120, uh, 141. I, I nailed the hell out of it. Uh, then we went on. For me, I shot 624. Uh, I forgot how many I hit. It's like a couple. We'll put the uh, picture up for you. 335. I cleaned it. And then uh, 594, I did fairly well on that one also. And then we swapped places, right? It's not just me, right? Um, Carl can shoot good. Let's see how somebody else does. Now, he got down behind my gun. Right? Now, remember, this thing has parallax. It's, he can't make it parallax free. He did adjust the ocular lens to his eye so the reticle wasn't good focus. I'm six foot. That puts me a couple inches above uh, what the reticle was designed for. All right, my retic, my my aura is six four, guys, but I'm really only uh, I'm really only six feet tall. And then we did the same thing. I went out, I lazed the jeep, made sure I was at set distance, and same thing. I I had my pile of fortune cookies. First one wound up being uh, 720 meters, and um, uh, once I was there, Chad milled me. I went and sat in the golf cart. Chad shot. Uh, he didn't hit a fucking thing. He didn't hit nothing. Excuse my language. He didn't hit nothing. Okay, fine. That's part of the test. Um, pulled the next fortune cookie, 550. I'm sorry, uh, 250 meters. I drove all the way back in the 250 meters away. I felt like I was standing right next to him. He cleaned it five for five. I had checked the next uh, fortune cookie. I had to go all the way back to 495. He cleaned all of them. From there, I only had to go a little bit. The fourth fortune cookie was 525, and he got four out of five at that distance. Pretty good. Now, the winds weren't bad that day. Um, the longer distances, we used the wind dots. Uh, Chad's a school-trained sniper. I was a school-trained sniper, very familiar with estimating winds. Uh, we didn't have any issues with it. Now, putting range estimation aside, using the hash marks and everything, How's the BDC itself, the bullet drop compensator? We shot it at only eight different distances. So we did a few more using an actual laser range finder. Now, everybody said, well, a infantry guy wouldn't have a laser range finder. I disagree with that because a lot of hunters use laser range finders. I know bow hunters that use laser range finders. I know golfers that use laser range finders. So anyways, we went back out and we did some more shooting at different distances using the 
the uh, laser range finder, a couple different distances, and uh, the BDC, it's close. I'm glad we're shooting full-size E-types instead of small plates. If you're a three-gun guy, uh, you might be off low or high just shooting 10-inch steel plates with this thing. But if you're the infantryman or that operator that wants to be able to shoot longer distances across the desert floor in the dark, um, honestly, the BDC is very, very close. Right? I was very pleasantly surprised with that. Um, now, that's not just what we do with this, right? What else do we do? How about shooting it at night? Easy enough. So uh, we took it back out to the range and um, we ran both the um, clip-on uh, thermals and, from FLIR and the clip-on Gen 3s. Now these are awesome. Flip, uh, flip them up, mount them right in front. You just have to know whether it's repeatable and how far it moves it off. Um, but again, we tried both the thermals and uh, Gen 3s using an IR luminaire on side of the gun. Shot great. The BDCs work good. Uh, we only got out uh, shy of 500 meters. Couldn't go out past that. Um, let me rephrase that. Using the flare, losing, using the thermal, I could see Chad great at six, 700 meters. I could see him great. I couldn't see the paper target. I, um, temperature of the paper and the wood was the same temperature as the air around it. I couldn't see the paper with the thermals. Uh, I could see Chad great. Sorry, I'm not going to shoot Chad just for your video. So I didn't actually shoot that. Um, but within, I think our furthest target was 475 in the dark with the thermals and the Gen 3s. Uh, they shot great. I, I know what to dial in. Uh, for these scopes because uh, they do have repeatable movement of the point of aim, point of impact. Anything does when you're adding a uh, lens in front of the objective lens. Now, all right, so they do great in the dark. What about for CQB? Now, if you're just using that ACOG, the other one we tested, it's a fixed four power. You can get by with it, but I'm not big on it. CQB, I want an EOTech or I want a variable power that can truly go down to one. Now, I like the variable power. I've already told you why. Right now, this one is not quite a true one power. It comes down in extremely close to one power. All right. um, when the guy first showed it to me and I held it up and looked through it, it looked as a true one power. However, like I said, my eyes are not the best. When I actually changed... The, uh, the ocular lens on the back focused that on the reticle. When I brought it back up, it's more like a 1.05 or uh, maybe a 1.1. But honestly, that is a lot closer to being a true one power than so many of the other uh, variable power scopes that I've used before. They, um, I got a Smitten Bender, got a, a couple others. Uh, older ones that do not go anywhere near one power. The lowest, they, closest they get is 1.1. This one did much, much better. It was much closer to being a true one power scope. So for CQB, this thing's awesome, closer to one power. What makes it even better is it's got that EOTech circle. You turn on the illuminated reticle, you light up that circle. It's hard to see the little dot in the middle, but brother running around, panning barricades, coming through doorways, tearing my range up in the dark. It was awesome, 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 All right? Um, so anyways, that, you know, I've got an issue with the battery knob, uh, like I said, but other than that, brother, I had a blast with this thing, All right? So how do we conclude the video? First off, dude, it is a solid one to eight first focal plane. That's a bonus right there. The BDC reticle, the ACSS, it, it works great. It worked a lot better than I thought it would. The wind dots were spot on. I'm uh, not big on the wind dots on a lot of other scopes, tremors, things like that. All right, now, so awesome. The one downside, yes, this is a primary arm scope. Everybody was hoping I would do a review of a four to $600 scope. Guys, because they went with the Japanese glass and it getting made there and making this a top of the line scope. This puppy is $1,300. That's pricey, I know, but it comes back to you get what you paid for. So um, if you want to run this in combat, would I? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. If you'd asked me a year ago, would I run a primary arm scope in combat? I would have told you, hell no. I'm gonna go with Leopold Night Force, Smitten Bender. 
But uh, honestly, this scope, brother, so far it's it's bomb proof. It is. Uh, it's tough. The glass is awesome, and um, very very pleasantly surprised. I say, hey, gents, uh, I delayed putting out this video because when I watched it, when I was editing it, I, there were just so many things that I wanted to capture when uh, to, to have in the video. Uh, for example, trying the different uh, different weights of ammo, trying it on different guns, uh, shooting three gun with it, because a lot of guys are not hunting human beings. They want this for sport. They want it for hunting. They want it for competition. Okay, let's pause. Let's go do this. So Fast forward, and um, I'm here to give you guys the final review of it. I ran this gun through three gun season. I actually ran this in the MGM, uh, not the MGM. I actually ran this in the Rock Castle Pro-Am, and on, on this very gun right here, ran awesome. I was shooting uh, 62 grain uh, and some 68 grains. Uh, depending on whether it was long range or not. We also went back and shot this with 77 grain Black Hills. It ran great with 77 grain Black Hills, easily getting out past 800 meters, easily getting out past 800 meters. Uh, matter of fact, at the, at the Rock Castle pro -Am, the only stage that I beat Jerry Micklick on, because Jerry Micklick was in my squad, the only stage that I beat him was the stage that had the 500 meter small steel plate and I got it with my second bullet uh, and I don't even know if he got it at all. I, all I know looking at times that was the only stage that I got him on. Uh, uh, he blew me away with shotgun pistol everything else. The guy's a machine. Back to the scope. Uh, you notice I added the throw lever to it. I've tried it on different guns, tried it with different ammo and honestly, gents, you've heard me say it before, that if I could only have one rifle, just one, it wouldn't have an EOTech on it. You know, I love the EOTech for CQB, but if I could only have one gun, I would want a variable power scope that you could dial down to one power. This thing comes down very, very close to a true one power, and it's still got the, B, the, uh, the bullet drop compensator in it. So between the bullet drop compensation with the wind dots and everything else, gents, I'm here to tell you uh, this right here would be the scope for me. Now, they offer the ACSS reticle in, uh, if, if you can't afford the Platinum Series, if all you can afford is the Silver Series, cheaper scope, still has the ACSS uh, reticle in it. We actually picked up uh, several of those. We got them out. Chad ran one a uh, bunch, uh, bunch of time, including he ran that at the Rock Castle Pro-Am. We got it in the hands of a couple of our patrons, other people. That's a one to six power Silver Series, uh, a lot cheaper than the Platinum. So it depends what your budget is. That said, both the one to six and the one to eight ran great. So if you've got the money, I go with the Platinum Series. This thing's awesome. If I could only have one scope, this would be it right now. If you can't afford the Platinum Series, you're looking for something cheaper, we heard you. We heard the comments on past videos. Check out the Silver Series, the one to six, still has the ACSS reticle in it. And the thing's awesome. It really is. Now, um, timing of the video. It's the holiday season. Everybody's looking for those gifts to put under the Christmas trees, either for yourself or for that family member looking for that one well-rounded optic. If you're looking for a one to eight series or even a one to six and you want a good uh, reticle that's got wind dots in it and a BDC, great glass, I'm here to tell you uh, I like the ACSS. So what we've done, I can't put links on YouTube, but if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see links for this scope. You use our link from Primary Arms and I'm pretty sure they throw in a free scope mount with it. So anyways, uh, my, fi my final thoughts, awesome scope, and uh, no doubt you guys are gonna enjoy it too. Y'all take care, shoot straight. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything. If you like the shirt that we're wearing in the video, you can get it in our store.